program to bring you this important message. Good morning. Today is Wednesday, November 1st, and my name is Scott Shera. I am Grace's dad, and one of the reasons that God allowed Grace's premature death was to save others and to wake others up, and that included me. And I have become a full-time advocate as I am waking up and deprogramming myself, and that is by far the most I have learned since Grace's death is how programmed I have been. I'm a Christian and I see things through that worldview. Uh, because of the urgency of the message today, this is going to be our first live program, which you already are, know that if you're watching. It also happens to be another first today, which is this is the first uh, week of our anniversary of this program. So we've been starting tomorrow is the literal one year anniversary of our program. So Don, can you bring Jamie Walden in please? Welcome Jamie, it is really an honor to have you as my guest. Yeah, thank you, sir. I appreciate you having me on and hopefully I won't be too bumbly uh, since we're live. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, we'll pray yeah, for the, the technology to, to, to work. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I first saw Jamie on a podcast discussing Apophis about six months ago, and that, that led to me hearing you with a couple of gentlemen from End Time Productions a few months ago, and then ultimately listening to several of your Matters of the Heart sermon. So I'm going to do a brief bio. Jamie sent me a bio. His entire bio will be in the show notes. But Jamie is an author, a military Corps infantry sergeant, police officer, firefighter, paramedic specialist, not all these today, but I mean, this is all the things he has been, uh, tactical medic and disaster response specialist. And he's turned to uh, becoming a pastor. He's been a missionary and now he is also a national speaker. He covers a wide range of topics affecting the church today from prophetic trends and analysis of our identity in Jesus Christ as warriors in the kingdom. And as I said, the complete bio will be in the show notes. Jamie, we're going to go through a bunch of questions. You know, we're going to end up zeroing in on how the United States fits into it. That's why I chose to do this live. But before we start, I would like you to uh, start with prayer, but then as you close the prayer, I'd like to have you touch on the power of prayer versus the purpose of prayer, because that's a sermon that you did, which was, it's very powerful. So if you would do that, I would yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Let's pray. Lord, we do just thank you and praise you for the opportunity and even the space for grace and for a refreshing of our eyes as you um, spoke through your servant, Ezra, Lord, that you have given us a little bit of space for grace in this nation. We know, um, even especially on, on um, Scott's program here, deprogramming, that we as a nation are not owed your grace at all. We are owed nothing but um, severe discipline and judgment, God, because of the lawlessness that we've allowed to permeate in the land and infiltrate every aspect of our corporate reality. So we thank you, Lord. We thank you that we can gather, that we can pray, that we can seek your face because of the completed work of your son, Jesus Christ. And that we can have an audience with you and commune with you and dwell and hide and abide in you, God. It's such a gift. I thank you, Lord, even for this advent of technology to be able to share uh, your good news. Although the enemy um, intends it for evil, God, you use it for your good to the saving of many lives. So we even thank you for the opportunity to uh, carry the message far and wide through technology. And we just pray that you would guard it and protect it from the evil one, God, and, and allow this message to get where it's supposed to be to ignite the hearts of men and women over the face of the earth to run into you, God, and find an identity in your son, Jesus, alone as the days grow darker and darker. So we just thank you, Lord, and we pray your blessing over this time today. We pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, you so, probably didn't know. So yeah, our, Scott, the, oh, well, I was ahead. just going to say, you probably didn't know that we as a family since Grace's murder have really focused on Genesis 50, 20, which you ended up quoting in your prayer. So that's that's pretty neat. So go, go ahead, Jamie. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, it is, it is. I actually just preached on it on uh, on Sunday, you know, talking about the the famine, pre- preparation for famine in the land, but not a famine of food and drink, as we're told in Amos 8, but a famine of the hearing of the word of the Lord, you know, and that it's the most horrific famine in the history of humanity is about ready to befall the face of the earth. And it says that men will stagger, they'll stagger like drunkards searching for the word of the Lord from north to east and from sea to sea, and they will not find it. You know, he says in that day, they'll call on my name and I will not answer them. He says in that day, they'll seek my face, but they'll only see my back. He says in that day, your prophets and your priests talking about the lukewarm evangelical fished in pastors of this Western centric apostate Christianity. It says they'll cry out for revelation. They'll do anything they can to get revelation from God and from his word, and he will not answer them. And so, uh, yeah, and in that in that preparation for the famine in the land, you know that it's it's all this centrality and the type and shadow of the story of Joseph, right? From Genesis uh, forty one, forty two, all the way to Genesis fifty, and uh, and you see that consolidation of how the Lord uses famine specifically to shape the hearts of men back into His presence. And what's interesting, even about that, I know this isn't what we're talking about, but it's just fascinating to to dig into it. Is that when you look at the type and shadow of Joseph and even the Exodus, that's exactly what we see at the end of the age and the last epoch and the latest in church age is the same pendulum swing all the way back to that where um, the Lord utilizes these different things to get the hearts of men. And if you notice what Jacob and the 12 sons and all the surrounding nations around the Egypt, Egyptological uh, control mechanism had to do is first they gave all their money for food. Then they gave all their possessions for food. Then they gave all their heritage and their legacy for food. Then they gave their bodies as labor for food. Then they gave their bodies sexually and their children for food. And eventually they will give their souls for food, as we're told in the book of Revelation regarding the mark of the beast. Like that is the centrality where all this is going. I know we're going to break into it later on with uh, what's uh, what's transpiring in the Middle East and not just the Middle East. There's a global conflagration occurring right now in real time that most people aren't super in tune to, at least in the West. Everybody else in the world seems to have their finger on the pulse of it, uh, on their finger on the pulse of what's going on, except for, uh, again, Americans in general, but in particular, the evangelical Fishtons of the United States of America. So uh, it, it is all prescient and it is all uh, beyond significant. There's no way that you could use enough powerful language break open the thesaurus and use powerful adjectives to describe the lateness of the hour. You can't sensationalize it. You can't hyperbolic it. It is that the hour is that late. And right now there is a a convergent zenith that broke open three weeks ago. There had been this slow grinding action for really, in particular, the last 12 years, especially when Obama got elected in office. A seal was broken. Supernatural things started to happen on the face of the earth through all their dark arts and their mystery school cultic practices and all these things that they were ushering in. And what we saw recently in the last three years, the thing that happened in the last three years was, I kept saying as soon as it broke out that this is a softening tactic. This is asymmetric warfare softening tactic for the kinetic stuff that comes next. I said that within the first week of that stuff breaking out. And then here we are now, three years later, sure enough, exactly as as I said, not because I said it, because the Lord's word reveals it, that's exactly what's what's happening. So what people need to know and understand is that they're taking us somewhere, Scott. They're taking us somewhere very, very particular. But also, as I say that, I want to remind the listeners is they have no power other than what God allows them to do. So yes, they, the they, however you want to coin them, the global elite, the massinations, the powers of darkness, principality, spiritual wickedness in high places, and, and all their underlings all the way down to your county road commissioners that are sold out to these things. It goes all the way down, up and down vertical alignment of these chain of command of lawlessness. Um, they have no power in and of themselves other than what God allows them. It says, can calamity come upon a nation unless the Lord has decreed it? No, that's a facetious question from God to people. Like, no, I am on the throne. I am the sovereign. My son is seated at the right hand. He's not spooked by these things going on. He's not in consternation and anxiety or dissipations so that that day comes upon him unaware. They are seated. Everything is fully under control. Psalms 2, right? So, uh, 
they are actually taking us somewhere in this convergent zenith of what's going on right now in the Middle East. And again, I don't want to narrow it to the Middle East because that's what happens is people get myopic. That's actually a particular psychological strategy, psychological warfare strategy uh, called the Cloward and Piven strategy. Maybe you're familiar with that, Scott, or your listeners are. They've heard it before. But that's the hope of the global elite, for lack of a better word, is that via their Cloward and Piven strategy, you will not be able to connect all the micro that's going on in order to understand the macro. So generally when I speak to stuff, I try to speak to it from the macro, from the 60,000 foot uh, view of the reality of what's going on. So when I say, you know, what's breaking out in the Middle East, it's not the Middle East, it's Asia, it's Europe, it's the African continent, it's Central and South America, it's even the Polynesian island chains, it's the Oceanic island chains, it is the entire earth is literally being consumed right now with this scorched earth policy of the powers of darkness unto a setting up of this stage for the man of lawlessness and perdition to arise in Jerusalem to proclaim himself that he is God and there is no other God but him. That is where all this is leading. And this particular moment in time is so strategic. It is so perfectly strategic to get them exactly where they want to go. It is asymmetric warfare 101, psychological warfare 101, human intelligence, signals intelligence, all these different overlay of of military acumen and stratagem all going on all at one time and in real time, for lack of a better word. Scott? Wow. I'm going to I'm going to call that your opening statement right now. And my listeners are used to me talking in terms of esoteric dialectics versus exoteric dialectics. And that's really what you were 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 saying with I, I hadn't heard that term before. But, you know, before I'm going to dive into a bunch of questions to peel back that open. But before we do, I want to come back to uh, it's it, it, it's it's so important that that I wanted to start with this, the purpose of prayer versus the power of prayer. So just give a quick comment on that. And then I'm going to peel back what you said in your open through some questions. Yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, a lot of people in, uh, and if people want, they can go um, view a whole sermon on it. or really like working through the scriptures, you know, is important to like work through the word because we have a lot of paradigms that are lacking, right? It, it, it is part and partial to the lay to see in church age. We say we're wealthy and in need of nothing but we've never asked God how he sees us. And if we were to ask him, he would say, actually, I'm so glad you asked, sons and daughters. You're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked, and I'm gonna spit you out of my mouth. So I'm giving you some counsel. Repent, right? And come purchase from me white raiments to cover your nakedness and, and salve from me so that your eyes might see and gold from me that's purified in a fire, right? And so even the even prayer in our prayer life, we have greatly reduced prayer. And we think it's all about the power of prayer. You have all these NAR, New Apostolic Reformation, Bethel Hill song, uh, completely new age occultic practices running around, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, right? Then you have, you swing the pendulum to, you know, Gospel Coalition or Southern Baptist Convention where they've, they've nullified prayer altogether, right? There's these Pollyanna, you know, placating, prayers from the puppeteers in the pulpits that are completely ineffectual and ineffective because it's not about the power of prayer. It's about the purpose of prayer. And when you understand the purpose of prayer, it transforms everything. The way that you even commune with the Lord most high through his son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy spirit to even begin to navigate, uh, just and solidify a quiet confidence in the Lord when we know the purpose of prayer, not the power of it. People try to wield the power of prayer like the occultics do. Like you said, the esoteric dialectic. I love that word. I always talk about the the uh, deception dialectical, which was birthed by um, uh, Stalin and and uh, you know the the communist theosophy dialectic that was birth, but the esoteric dialectic, that's a, a perfect way of coining that, Scott. I'll probably use that from here on out. I'll try to give you credit wherever wherever I say it. But, um, Believe me, God gets the credit. I didn't come up with it on my yeah, own. Yeah, but you're, you're right. So what most people do is they, they actually try to wield power no different than the occultists, than the witches, white or black witches, the warlocks and the wizards and the illuminists and the Freemasons and every other level of 
of esoteric mystery school based teachings, even even including the Church of Satan through Anton LaVey and some of the other uh, freak show reprobates that that lead those movements. Um, even the New Agers, the entire role of the New Age, including your holy yoga Christians that think you can drink from the cup of demons and the cup of Christ as you're opening your chakra for the Kundalini serpent to come and intertwine your inner your inner being through all your uh, yoga practices. Go study what a yogi is, Christian yoga practitioners. Um, they they believe in the power of prayer. They try to wield the power of prayer. They try to manipulate the power of prayer in the family of God through the sufficiency of Christ Jesus. We are to operate out from the purpose of prayer. And the purpose of prayer is the singularity that we would be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, and fully glorify him. So the purpose of prayer is, Lord, sanctify this to me. Not Lord, save me. Not Lord, do this. Not Lord, do that. Like we're always seeking the hand of God, but not the face of God. The purpose of prayer is that we would actually long for and seek the face of God. And in response, his desire is that we be conformed to the image of his son. So we pray, Lord, not save me. and Lord, not deliver me. We pray like Christ did. Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not why my will be done. Your will be done. I'm completely submitted, not surrendered. Huge distinction. I did a whole long sermon on the difference between submission and surrender. We are to be fully submitted to the Lord in these things unto the purpose of prayer, which is the conformity to the Son. And in that, God gets glorified and that our souls are at rest and peace and secure. We have a quiet confidence that surpasses all understanding. We have a peace that surpasses all understanding. We have a soundness of mind in Christ Jesus, literally the mind of Christ himself, that makes us strong and secure and steadfast and resilient and enduring and joy-filled all at the same time when we operate out from the purpose of prayer rather than trying to wield the power of prayer. Wow. Fantastic. Thank you, Jamie. All right. So we're going to go back to yeah. your open. I want to peel back some things. And I want to start with Mystery Babylon. And I would like you to comment on your perspective of Mystery Babylon in and also your reference in your open about type and shadow. So how does that fit together, the type and shadow um, principle, I guess you would say, and and your perspective of Mystery Babylon? Yeah, I mean, it's it's my perspective, just to get this out of the way, right out of the gate, is that Mystery Babylon is the United States of America. And anybody who has kind of a classical dispensational uh, background, academic study or teaching, you know, they're going to categorically reject that. Um, that's okay. We, we can have debates about that all day long. But believe me, I, I haven't, I don't just say that facetiously or, you know, just as a, as a bent and biased opinion. Uh, that's through lots and lots of study and research. I actually have a degree in, in history and did a lot of comparative history. Uh, you know, obviously study the word in eschatology um, for 15 years straight. And, and uh, you know, I've heard all the arguments about it being a revived Roman Empire, about it being a revived Babylonian Empire, about it being, you know, a revived Holy Roman Empire, the intermixing of the Vatican along with the Roman edicts based out of Rome and the Vatican and all that. And I, I, I get all that. I hear all that intellectually. I understand the arguments. But there's not. But when you actually know the root of the United States of America and when you get a peek behind the veil of what we're doing globally through our intelligence apparatus and our Babylonian money magic systems, you would have no doubt. You'll never again would you doubt that United States of America is Mystery Babylon up to and including the fact that this is actually a place of the elect exiles of dispersions where the majority of the Jews globally have been hidden inside Mystery Babylon for a time until the Lord is ready to judge Babylon and he starts pulling them back to Israel. An exact type and shadow, right? And so when you look at the most baseline level of breaking open your understanding about Mystery Babylon uh, is... And it's the daughter of Babylon, Mystery Babylon, right? It's an offshoot of the original Babylon. It's a genetic, it has the phenotypic expressions of Babylon proper. It is the daughter of Babylon. So it is a genetic offspring. It's a genetic offspring of the original Babylon. If you go through the etymology of even our frescoes and our edifices and the founding uh, aspects and the layouts of the District of Columbia, like right there, it's like, let's stop there. What is the District of Columbia? 
Who is Colombia? Does anybody ask that? Who's Colombia? Why do the majority of the presidents come from Columbia University? What is Columbia Pictures? Why is there a mountain with stars falling on it, surrounding it for Paramount Pictures? What is the city of angels, Los Angeles on the one side, and then you have Phoenix, and then you have Phoenicia, and then you have all these things in between coming all across the land of Amaruca, which is the original, I, I, I believe it's Quechuan. Don't quote me on that. Quechuan language, Amaruca, from which we get America, which means the land of the winged plume serpent. Who is the winged plume serpent? All we got to do is go to Genesis 3. And the seraphim appeared, appeared in the tree of knowledge of good of evil. Not the cherubim. It was not Lucifer himself. It was a seraphim, which is defined as a fiery wing plumed serpent. That's the definition of a seraphim. So literally the land itself of the United States of America is claimed and owned specifically from not just a principality like all the nations of the earth, but a high, high ranking principality. There's a reason why there was 13 colonies. There's a reason why there's a Phoenix on their bill, dollar bill. There's a reason why there's the talisman and every one of your pockets has a, a Egyptological pyramid that's unfinished with the all-seeing eye of Lucifer, Horus, Osiris, Nimrod, whatever, with 33 stones on it. There's a reason why it's the District of Columbia and why it's laid out in the shape of a Molochian owl along with the largest Egyptological and Babylonian monuments on the face of the earth are in Washington, D.C. So much so that some of the edifices are literally an exact replica of per the Temple of Pergamon, which we know biblically, the Temple of Pergamon is the seat of Satan itself. The Temple of Pergamon is the seat of Satan. That's what Washington, D.C. is based off of. And actually, even the name Capitol, Capitol is a very, very particular choice of words. Nobody else had used that word around the world from, from what I've studied than the United States at its founding. They chose the word Capitol particular because it capital was the name for the temple of Jupiter, which is Zeus, which is Lucifer. They're all et etymological uh, transitions of what is historically the name for Lucifer himself. So they literally named, this is the seat of Satan. This is the seat of Lucifer. This is the capital. It is the statue of Isis, Semiramis, Ishtar, Inanna, not the Statue of Liberty. It is the statue of Columbia. It is the district of Columbia. That's the feminine, the, the matriarchal feminine deity side of all this other stuff. So all that to say is, the United States of America is unequivocally mystery Babylon. Look at Sir Francis Bacon, Adam Westhop, what they said about the rise of the Atlantean age and the return of the golden age of the gods would come out from this continent. That's why they created religious liberty from the onset was so that their religion could coexist. And nobody asked in what God we trust. Nobody ever asked that. Study the founding fathers, although many of them were authentic. There was a lot of authentic Judeo-Christian values at the onset of the United States of America. They were allowed to coexist so that the occultic mystery school practices, practices from the Bavarian Illuminist could also arise without persecution. So like, hey, you guys won't be persecuted, but neither will we. We'll grow in parallel. And when the day comes, we'll just assert ourselves over you and usurp Judeo-Christian values. That day has arrived, ladies and gentlemen. We are the number one exporters of pornography. We are the number one consumers of child pornography. We are the number one exporters of child sex trafficking. Where do you think it's all? What do you think Ukraine centered on? You think Ukraine centered on a land grab because it's the breadbasket of Europe? It's centered on Hunter Biden's laptop, the black book of all the global child sex trafficking. It was centered from the U.S., through the Caribbean island chains, hello Epstein Island, and unto Ukraine, where through the different underground uh, criminal syndicates, it was pushed out around the whole face of the earth. That is why the U.S. is sending everything we have at Ukraine to protect the secrets of the dirtiness of the United States of America. We have deceived the whole world with our pharmakia, as it says in the scriptures regarding mystery of Babylon, Revelation 18, they deceive the whole world with their sorceries. The word sorceries is only ever 
rooted in the Greek lexicon as pharmakia, from which we get our modern word pharmaceuticals. It is the mixing of roots for the altering of the body and of the mind of the consciousness, which was forbidden by God that the fallen angels in Genesis 6 and onward brought to, you, to mankind to make war against God. And it says, in her was found the souls of men. Uh, they were the hammer in all the earth. They lived in luxury. They were the highest consumeristic culture on the face of the earth. Mystery Babylon is the highest consumeristic culture on the face of the earth. It's a place filled with deep water ports where all the countries of the world send their goods for their licentious appetite. They traffic in the souls of men. They make their whole world drunk with their immoralities. There's your pornography. They deceive the whole world with their pharmacias. And in her is found the slain of all the earth, which I don't think we've seen yet till this thing that a lot of people have taken into their bodies is made manifest over the long term. It's a ticking time bomb. It's a time released global depopulation agenda that's built into that. That's coming. So, um, yeah, when I talk about the United States as mystery Babylon, I mean it unequivocally. I mean, from the Bohemian Grove to D.C. to every capital, every state capital. Again, there's that word capital. Go research the etymology of the word capital. We're one of the few places on the face of the earth that use it to the fact that we had the Arch of Baal brought to Washington, D.C. so that it could mark and seal the entire United States of America for what comes next. The ancient Arch of Baal itself was reconstructed in Washington, D.C. in the shadow of the Capitol building. This is yeah. what they're doing, ladies and gents. And so most people have this Pollyanna, rah-rah, you know, conservative, right-wing activist, you know, stance for the United States of America. And they just don't understand where this is going because of where it began. They don't understand it. And, and, and if you don't understand it, you will be unwittingly, you will become a victim and a casualty on a field of battle that you do not understand. If, if, we're, we're ill-informed about these things or under-informed about these things because your emotion is always being preyed upon. It is asymmetric psychological warfare 101. It is mass media, propaganda, mockingbird media, Operation Mockingbird, CIA, CIA uh, uh, operation that was put into place in, I believe it was the mid-60s into the 70s to have the most secure form of mass mind control propaganda through visual media enter the united states of america right so anyway scott i could go on for that forever but uh, well, I'll, I'll try to try to take well, a break well thanks for that explanation you know in simple terms we know that the united states through its pharmacia convinced 71 percent of the globe to take the bioweapon and as you said i mean we we do have no clue as to the long-term ramifications. I mean, the short-term are horrendous, but the long-term is even worse. You know, in your intro, you also mentioned about the urgency, and I've heard you talk about the spirit of the age is the number one indicator of the lateness of the hour, and then God gives them over to a great delusion. So can you comment about the urgency with the spirit of the age? Why is it different than World War II, for example? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question that a lot of people get. And that's kind of like, that's even the the prophetic, I'm like, yeah, that everything you say is a prophetic fulfillment. So even when people go, oh, blah, 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 you know, they could have said the same thing in World War One. They could have said the same thing in World War Two. They could have said the same thing during the Napoleonic Wars or the Black Plague or the whatever. You know, they always try to cherry pick these very isolated incidents in world history to say, so now my normalcy bias says be dismissive of what's going on right now. It is such a red herring argument. It's ridiculous. Uh, and actually it's prophetic fulfillment that it says there will be mockers and scoffers saying, where is this coming of the Lord? Everything goes on business as usual, blah, blah, blah. It says that's what they're going to be saying exactly as the things are all coming into alignment for the return of the Lord. And, and so the spirit of the age, you know, coming back to that question about the spirit age being the number one indicator to lateness of the hour is most people want to look at the impure are the, the subjective or no, sorry, the objective empirical data, the lateness of the hour, earthquakes, volcanism, you know, uh, famines, pestilence, uh, uh, wars, rumors of wars, uh, human loss of life. These, these very hard objective 
uh, you know, graphable for lack of a better word. I know that's not even a word, but you know, the ability to graph these things out in an objective way and go, that will be the indicator of the lateness of the hour. However, when we deal with the word honestly and we look at it, actually the number one indicator to lateness of the hour is the spirit of the age. And in particular, the spirit of the Christians. It's constantly speaking to the church, every epistle and even the gospels and on into the Old Testament everywhere. It is constantly affirming the lateness of the hour will be dictated by the spirit of the claimants of God and Jesus Christ as as their savior and as their sovereign in every way and area. It's the apostasy the apostasy, the lawlessness of the church, the abandoning of the faith. Apostasy means an official revolt or defection from a religious dogma you once held to be true. It is a complete repudiation. It says the way of truth will come into disrepute. They will not tolerate sound doctrine. They will allow secret doctrines of demons to bring in destructive heresies. They'll deny the very God who bought him. They'll give heed to seducing spirits. They will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They will be lovers of self. They will always be learning and never able to come to an understanding of the truth. They will tolerate the Jezebels. They'll tolerate the, they'll run after Balaam's heir. They'll have the, the appetite of the Nicolaitans. And they will be so self-deluded and delusional, Laodicea, that they will say, in the name of Jesus, they'll say, we are wealthy in need of nothing, having no idea that God actually spits them out of their mouth. And it is the only church age because of the spirit of the age that he is actually on the outside of the church trying to get back in. That's how significant it is. He's on the outside trying like requesting an audience with his people again because they pushed him out. Yet they say they're doing everything to honor God. And so. That is the signification of the lateness of the hour. And again, this isn't any one particular particular movement or denomination or bent or bias or whatever is going on. It is the spirit of the age. Go to a seeker friendly church. Go to a Baptist church. Go to a NAR church, which are the most horrible things on the face of the earth, the Bethel Hillsong ilk. You know, go to a whatever church. It's the spirit of the age, not the spirit of those guys. And so what most Christians want to do is go, oh, yeah, huh, Joel Osteen, yep, those guys, you know, Benny Hinn, Joel Osteen, they're, you know, it's like, dude, those guys aren't even in the faith. Like, that's not even consideration. That They're, they're not even remotely in the faith. So what, quit trying to point to them as if, yeah, that those are the apostates. No, we are the apostates. We all, oh, it is the spirit of the age. And it's only in a fear of the Lord that you can be wise and grow in discernment to even understand the spirit of the age and start breaking off those Babylonian Egyptological strongholds in our lives where we say we're wealthy and in need of nothing. Why? Because we're relatively moral and we're super duper friendly. And we did trunk or treat yesterday, literally fellowship with the highest child sacrifice day on the face of the earth. And we fellowship with darkness so that we could be relevant to our, our reprobate neighbors and host yeah. trunk or treat. It, insane, right? Insane, but that is the indicator of the lateness of the hour um, that you were asking about, Scott, is is in particular the apostasy. And what most people don't understand, 2 Thessalonians 2, is it says the man of lawlessness cannot, which is the Antichrist, cannot be revealed until the lawlessness occurs in the church first. It says until the great apostasia occurs. The church is the one who paves the way for the Antichrist to come on the scene. Not the global elite. The church makes the way for the Antichrist. And nobody wants to deal with that. Nobody wants to deal with that. So, Scott? Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I think that's spot on, Jamie. Thank you for uh, wrapping that in with the second th th <laughs> Easy for me to say, the second Thessalonians. I know, no, that's a tough one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know you say periodically you have a speech impediment, but uh, I just read mine yeah. also. I just laugh. It's funny. Uh, yeah, it's funny. All right. I don't care. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> well, I want to I want to get into the uh, Hamas is Israeli war right now, and I want to start with the idea that Revelation eighteen nineteen says, "For in one hour she was made desolate," and that applies to the United States. People don't understand how the United States fits into this war, and so I'd like you to comment on that that 
uh, fact along with then the China factor and how the China factor really emphasizes that that literal fact of how the United States is going to be involved. Yeah, absolutely. I'll try to pull it all together. So, you know, for the listeners, what Scott's referencing is is Revelation um, 18 and 19, which is, as we were talking about, the destruction of Mystery Babylon, the fall of Mystery Babylon. Also, Jeremiah 50, 51 allude to that. And there's several other um, scriptures throughout the Old Testament that allude to it as well, too, that had a partial fulfillment with Babylon proper, right? The ancient kingdom of Babylon. And, and then it will have a full fulfillment with this mystery Babylon, this daughter of Babylon. Like we said, this, this uh, phenotypic expression of the original Babylon, spiritual Babylon. And um, the interesting thing about Babylon, the destruction of mystery Babylon, is that it says in a single day, in a single hour. It's instantaneous. Now, we just got that type and shadow of how that can happen in Israel. In a single day, in a single hour, while everybody's saying peace and security, I'll say, we'll never see harm. We'll never be a widow. Read Revelation 18. That's the spirit, the arrogancy of Mystery Babylon. That's similar to what just happened in Israel. We have the Iron Dome. We have the IDF on every border. We have the most sophisticated intelligence apparatus on the face of the earth. We have the most adept AI-driven facial recognition, biometric security perimeters on the face of the earth in Israel. Yet, in a single day, in a single hour, all their defenses were as nothing. I won't get into why that is. And they were overrun. The alarm went out. Nobody responded. It says, as a judgment on a nation, your fighting men will be like women in that day. It says, they'll blow the trumpet for war. Nobody will come out. That's exactly what we just saw in Israel. But what we know, that is a type and shadow of the wholesale destruction of Mystery Babylon, the United States. So why this is relevant to what's going on in Israel right now and globally is that that stage is being strategically set by all the nations, all the nations of the earth, including our European allies are clamoring and actively working behind the scenes for the wholesale destruction of the United States in a single day, in a single hour. And in fact, our elected, I use that word very loosely, in the United States of America, our elected officials are also actively participating through asymmetric means to bring about the wholesale destruction of the United States of America because they believe they have a seat at the new table that's coming. Look at the recent things with the Chinese spy balloon and, and Diane Feinstein's you know Chinese connections and then her husband's Chinese connections and then Sweeney's Chinese connections and Harvard, Yale, MIT, all owned by the Chinese CCP. Our deep water ports owned by the Chinese CCP. A Chinese general bought 175,000 acres on the Texas-Mexico border that Chinese troops are coming across freely right across the Rio Grande into a sanctuary, 200 square miles sanctuary owned by Chinese military officials in which they have put a heavy lift aircraft runway on private ground. And they were allowed to by the governor of Texas. So all you rah-rah Texans, you better understand that everybody's sold out and bought out in America for what comes next. And then you have the amassing of Chinese troops, including armor brigades on the, on the, on the Canadian border. Look at what's going on with Trudeau. Like everything is literally being amassed for the wholesale destruction of Mystery Babylon in a single day, in a single hour. There's a reason why all, all of our strategic military reserves, all of our armaments, you know, beans, bullets, band-aids, missiles, whatever, have all been pushed over to Ukraine, left in Afghanistan, left to the Taliban, left in Iraq, and then sold off to to uh, even the cartels and everybody else. There's a reason why all the uh, Israeli Merkava tanks are being destroyed by U.S. Javelin missiles that were taken taken to Ukraine and somehow now they're all in the Gaza Strip in the West Bank and with Hezbollah. How, wow, that's strange. How in the world could that happen? Oh, billions and billions of dollars that went overseas, bill, $85 billion in armaments left in the desert, billions of dollars being loosed back to Iran to do this thing. There's a reason why this is happening, ladies and gents. There's a reason why all the manufacturing power and prowess of the United States over the course of the last 30 years has been strategically moved to the east intentionally 
for this day that is coming on the United States of America. And all of our leaders are in on it. All the way down, as I said at the beginning, down to your county road commissioners and your teachers unions and your teachers boards, all bought and paid for by the Chinese. Not all, many, many are bought and paid for by the Chinese. And, and so when, we, when you look at this, what's going on with Israel and all the Arabic nations and a lot of Middle Eastern and even Eastern, Eastern Asian nations coming against Israel, that is strategic, not strategic, it is authentic biblical prophetic fulfillment of Psalm 83 war into Ezekiel 38 and 39 unto the Zechariah wars, right? Uh, like Zechariah 12 through 15 speaks to uh, all the nations coming out against Israel and even, even getting to Jerusalem itself before they actually turn and repent and cry out to God. But what's interesting is right smack in the middle of that, so I'm tying Mystery Babylon to what's going on in the Middle East, is in Ezekiel 38, talking about all the nations converging on Israel, Gog and Magog and Persia and Rush and, and the African continent, all the North Africa and the Horn of Africa and all the Middle Eastern countries and Ammon and Dadion and the Tents of Tarshish. And it lays out all these ancient Middle Eastern nations, which right now are every single one of Israel's enemies. I just challenge the listeners to go study who these guys are. It says all of them are coming on Israel right now in real time. And then in Ezekiel 38, 10, it makes this big transition. It says, and also at that time, and also circle it, it will come into their minds to come against the land of unwalled villages who sits in security to destroy her in a single hour. That's where the mystery Babylon destruction comes right smack in the middle of the Ezekiel 38, 39, Psalm 83, Zechariah war convergence on Israel. Because here's what the global elite know and the powers of darkness know is that they cannot, they cannot take out Israel until the United States is dealt with first. They can't do it. And Israel is the centrality of the focus of all the powers of darkness and all the global elite. It is all centered on Jerusalem. Everything is going to converge on Jerusalem. Every eye of the world is going to converge on Jerusalem. Every camera and cameraman is going to converge on Jerusalem. Every military, every economic maneuver, every uh, strategic maneuver, every geopolitical machination is all going to converge on Jerusalem. We know that unequivocally, and they actually are now the smallest, most insignificant sliver on the face of the earth. And every nation on the earth is only ever talking about Israel right now in real time. And it says, and also at that time, as they're doing that, they're going to come against the wall, the nation of unwalled villages. So on a single day and a single hour, many, many men and women that have a proven authenticity of receiving authentic dreams and visions from the Lord have seen the destruction of America by Chinese and Russian troops in a single day and a single hour. Many. I myself personally have had, before I knew any of this stuff, I was a brand new believer, came to know the Lord at 25 after the Marines and all that kind of stuff. And I was a brand new believer, had no clue. I was like a, a bubbling dope, just couldn't believe that I could be washed of my sins. And I was having dreams of Chinese troops everywhere in the United States of America, all at one time, wholesale slaughtering, genociding any Anglo people inside the United States of America. So now that gives you understanding as to why the crops are being bought, why the crops are being bought up by Bill Gates, why they're being bought up by the Chinese, why our deep water ports are being bought up by the Chinese, why our mineral resources underneath all of our national parks were given to the Chinese as collateral by Hillary Clinton and the Clinton State Department. They already own it all. They're coming to collect on it. They're coming to collect on it. And this is why the border crisis has nothing to do with anything like anything to do with Central South American Latino immigration. It has everything to do with the infiltration of Chinese, Hamas, and Hezbollah troops. Hundreds of thousands of them prepositioned. By the military analysts that I listen to and have spoken with, they say 250,000 to 350,000 Chinese military age fighting men are prepositioned across the United States. They said that doesn't even include the fifth column personnel as in Hamas, Hezbollah, cartel members and disenfranchised Latin American countries and things like that. They say they're everywhere. 
They have anti-tank missiles. They have surface-to-air missiles. They have cruiser weapon systems, mortar systems, heavy, heavy, medium, and light machine gun systems. All of it are staged all across the U.S., everywhere. They've been doing this softening, 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 buy off, buy off, buy off, pay off, whoever you can pay off, uh, get assured stand-down orders from your regional, uh, uh, what are they called? National Guardsmen, National Guardsmen commanders, buy them off. So they'll give stand-down orders, buy off governors, they'll give stand-down orders, buy off chiefs of police and critical infrastructure, uh, you know, water treatment, uh, electrical plant facilitators, whatever they're, they're all being paid off systematically for the last 15 years by the CCP for the day of kinetic invasion that's coming. That's where all this is going. And so the American normalcy bias is going to be so undone because they have no, they have no framework to even understand what's happening that the paralysis of analysis is going to overtake the United States of America and there won't even be a mount of defense. Again, that's biblical. It's that the trumpet will be sounded and nobody will come out to battle. The men will not leave the barracks and they have no weapons to fight with. It says that. That's judgment on the nation. They don't even have weapons to fight with. We don't even have oil because it was strategically removed on purpose so that the military officers that will not obey the stand down orders who do want to fight because they are authentically patriotic in particular the united states marine corps they will have nothing to fight with all their weapons are paperweights they don't have the supply chain to keep all the all the mechanized requirements of a war machine going and they have no oil to even push out and mount a defense that's why they've strategically removed all of this and then they blew up all the pipelines, the U.S. did, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, and just last week blew up another pipeline from Norway to Estonia to cut off any ability in Europe or over here for us to be resupplied to be able to mount a defense. Because America must fall so they can get Jerusalem. It must fall. This is a foregone conclusion. It's in all their, They don't even hide it, ladies and gents. They don't hide it. People just don't read. They don't read their white papers. They don't they don't read the things that are actually being passed in these bills in Congress. They don't read the economic data and what's going on. They don't read. They don't even know about the United States of America, not to mention geopolitically, geostrategically what's going on on the face of the earth. All of this has been agreed upon. It's all a done deal. It's a done deal. It's a tit for tat machination although not everybody's they're not in like perfect agreement obviously they all are worshiping satan and lucifer so a house divided cannot they're they're always going to be divided but they do have a quasi common goal to get to what will be established out of jerusalem with a two-state solution with a palestinian nation mark my words this is what's going to happen there will be a nation of palestine created overnight there will be a sharing of jerusalem East Jerusalem and West Jerusalem, two capitals in one city. Israel will be allowed to rebuild their third temple as a part of their peace deal. And then it's from there that a global governing body with a militaristic strong arm to enforce their governance will arise. And from that spot is where all the aspects of the tribulation period break forth. And it's happening in real time. Scott? Well, I want to drill that last piece down a bit. And I'm, I'm going to come back to the normalcy bias question, too, because you brought that up. But I want to first drill down this idea of, because uh, you just started it right at the end, is Satan counterfeiting God's timeline and prophecies? And so I, I listened to you and I agree with this, that there's going to be a counterfeiting and that's why world war three has to happen and then i i'd like you to oh, tie that question. together yeah. with agenda 2030 and then um ultimately close that answer with the peace and security false prophet that you know ultimately ties this this all together and shows that it was was all a counterfeit Yes. Awesome. That's a great question, Scott. Yeah. And it's sometimes because I'm always fire hosing and battling forever. <laughs> I forget to, to even hit on the very key opponents. The, what, what Scott just said, listeners, is so critical to understand is actually what they're amassing for. It's not amassing. It's it's an inevitability. It's happening. It's ha You just don't know it. It's already, it's done. There's no turning back. The entire world is about ready to be engulfed in a global conflagration with a limited nuclear exchange. 
let's give the qualifier limited. It's going to be a limited nuclear exchange. There's not a destruction of the earth. That doesn't happen in the scriptures until the Lord destroys it. There's not a destruction of the earth by an asteroid. There is effects and impacts of an asteroid that des that destroys parts of the earth. Then there's not a destruction of the earth by the machinations of men through global nuclear warfare. It doesn't happen. That's nowhere in the word. However, there is limited exchanges of these things, asteroids and nuclear weapons that are coming that are foretold of. And so what they're doing right now is they are setting the stage to utilize what we as Christians know is the red horse being loose, peace being taken from the earth, men given over to slaughter one another, Psalm 83 war, Ezekiel 38, 39 war, the destruction of mystery Babylon, Revelation 18. We know that these are aspects of what, what we'll call World War III, for lack of a better word. But the way it's going to be spun, mark my words, it will be spun as if it was the Battle of Armageddon. And because it was the Battle of Armageddon, now the Messianic figure in all the major world's religion, whether it's the Mahdi or the 12th Imam or the Maitreya or Jesus Christ or, or the Jews who have rejected Christ waiting for a Messiah, right? They're all, they all have a Messianic figure coming that this World War III is going to be spun and propagated as if it was the Battle of Armageddon and the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is the authentic Messiah. And by proclaiming peace and security and bringing in a counterfeit, counterfeit millennial reign devoid of Christ, the whole world's going to be deceived. They're going to convince all the world's major religions that this was their messianic eschatological fulfillment and now the millennial reign is beginning under the messiah this guy this god man this demigod they'll say that's your jesus christ that's your maitreya that's your 12th imam that's your mahdi that look we're all unified this is the guy that we've all been looking for and waiting for because we just had armageddon and now he's here in benevolence to restore peace and security and usher humanity into that direct self-directed evolutionary process of peace and security and utopia. And it's a total lie. It's a, it is the great deception, the great deception. This is not the battle of Armageddon. This is not bringing about a millennial reign. This is World War III bringing about the man of lawlessness and destruction out from Jerusalem. It is going to be the biggest faint maneuver and deception that the history of humanity has ever seen. And again, mark my words, this is exactly what is. I, I don't, I've never said things definitive like this before. This is going to happen. This is exactly what's going to happen. And I know that's, I'm taking a big, big, and exposing myself to all kinds of, of, uh, of, of uh, nasty grams. But um, the reality is, is that that's exactly where this is going. And even the elect will be deceived if it were possible because they don't understand what they're looking at. And there's going to be a cry for a dismantling of religious dogmas that created this war. Notice what's particular about this war, Scott is that it's based on religion. The world's leading religions, Christian, Judaism, Islam. All the other wars have not been about that. This is what is going to be become center stage is a global conflagration with limited nuclear stage based out from three religions that actually all have the same Abrahamic root covenantal thing of the same God. That's how they're going to spin it. We know that we do not serve the same God as Islam in any way, shape, or form, but that's how it's going to be spun. And so because of that, a false prophet is going to rise, reorder these religious dogmas that just created this horrific shared global traumatic experience. They're going to rework it and, and, and use it to bring about this deception of some counterfeit utopic, you know, kumbaya thing based out of Jerusalem with this messianic figure who has returned to restore order and he's going to perform lying signs and wonders and he's going to have a counterfeit resurrection and he's going to have a counterfeit father, son, and Holy spirit. And he's going to have a counterfeit healing of the masses. What I believe by his blood, that will be the mark of the beast that gets into the thing that everybody just took into their body. These last three years, that was a softening for being able to take something in your body eventually from this guy 
as it's by the blood of the lamb, by the blood of Christ Jesus that we're healed and that we have eternal life, they are going to spin it and say it's by the blood of this guy, this messianic figure, reconstituted and pushed out around the whole world. If you take it in your body, yes, it will change you, but for your good, it will change you because he's benevolent and it will be by his blood that you will be healed and by his blood that you can have life extension. Again, all apart from Christ. That's where all this is going, Scott. Wow. I'm, I'm, uh, that just was a fantastic answer. You know, what, what I want, this is maybe the most important question because, you know, you are, you have a confidence about saying these, these things. And, you know, so somebody hearing you for the first time, uh, would, would obviously ask, how sure are you? And where does this confidence come from? Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. I've never been asked that. I guess just the word, it's just the word. It, it, it's when, when you're immersed in the word of the Lord and, and, uh, and you have an authentic hunter and thirst for righteousness, like he's promised that you'll be satisfied, you know, and Proverbs two, Proverbs eight talks about like, if, if you cry out for wisdom, if you seek it, you know, if you search for it as for precious silver, you know, and, and then, then you'll find it. And actually we know that the wisdom of the Lord can only come from the fear of the Lord. It's presupposed that there's a rightful fear of the Lord. And it says to those who fear the Lord, he'll reveal to them the mysteries of the covenant. Like the church has made the gospel a mile wide and an inch deep. But what God says is when you fear the Lord, the gospel is an inch wide and a mile deep. It's the mysteries of the covenant, the powerful, wondrous nature of what, what God did through his son, Christ Jesus, under the redemption of humanity and a finger in the eye of the rebel insurgents of old. It's always been about warfare. Genesis 1-1 presupposes warfare, and it ends with the rider on the horse whose name is Faithful and True, riding out in justice and judgment to make war. And everything in between the bookends is about cosmic warfare against the glory of God. And we, created in his image, are right smack in the middle of the narrative as bumbling, for lack of a better word, beneficiaries of Christ's mission set that the Father would be fully known and fully glorified. And it says, in that the Son of Man was made manifest for this reason, 1 John 3, 8, that he might destroy the works of the evil one. Oh, you think I came to bring peace? You're wrong. I came to bring a sword. I, I came to rightly divide. Like, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force, right? Like, on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. On what rock? He was in Caesarea Philippi, in, in the shadow of Mount Hermon, where a third of these guys, those guys, rebelled against God to make an assault against God through humanity. Genesis 3, 16, and I will put warfare, enmity between the genetic offspring of the serpent and the genetic offspring of the one, the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman. Genetic warfare, even genetic warfare on a wholesale level, all the way through the end. Yeah. The, hence the flood, hence Genesis 6, hence Genesis 18, the Tower of Babel, the Nimrodian worship, the occultic practices, like what was going on in the land of Canaan? What's going on in all the hieroglyphs and the pictographs of all the major empires on the face of the earth? Why does China worship a dragon? Why is everything about the worship of the dragon? Why is America about the wing fiery plume serpent kind of sounds like a dragon? Why is Incan, Aztec, Nazca, Wari, whatever, Mayan culture centered on the worship of a dragon. I mean, what's going on, people? Nobody asks these things. So I guess in answer to your question, you know, and and it, well, well, let me add this. I just thought about this thinking of the mystery battle and what we were talking about. Have you noticed, Scott, that at the end of the age, when the actual battle of Armageddon does occur, which is historically at the most scholars would agree it's at the end of the millennial reign, is that it's the armies of the East. That's the only thing that's left. The armies of the East, a 200, man, a 200 million man army of the East is the only thing that's left. It doesn't talk about the West anymore because we are the West and we're done. Look at the Deagle Report 2025. Notice that everything is on a very, very tight timeline because remember, Scott, that Lucifer himself, it, we'll just use the name Lucifer for him, has had an audience with God even though he's been in rebellion. Read the book of Job. He is, still has an audience of God. Until in Revelation, he is finally cast down and now he knows time for the first time in his 
created whatever he is. He's restricted by time. And it says he comes down with great wrath. Why? Knowing that his time is short because of time. He's never been restricted by time. He's had an audience. He no longer, never again will he have an audience of God. He is finally cast out once and for all time. He has not been cast out yet, regardless of what most churches teach about the fall of Lucifer. His fall was his fall from iniquity, his fall from grace and God's presence. But his fall was not reserved to the earth. He still has an audience with God. There is a time coming where he's cast out forever. Now he's restricted by time. So I'm trying to tie this together with what's going on with the globally is that if you notice everything's 2025, 2025, 2025, 2025, you and agenda 2030 is actually about 2025. The Deagle report is about 2025. They say we have to have a global central bank digital currency by 2025. We have to have a global vaccine, vaccine passport tied to your biometric identification by 2025. They they all of this is centered on 2025, not to open a whole new can of worms. People can go uh, listen to it on, on YouTube. I did a big breakdown about it. Is also when Apophis, the ancient Egyptological serpent dragon god, Apophis, the god of darkness, death, destruction, and earthquakes, a god that it says the unique qualifier about the word Apophis or the ancient Egyptological deity of Apophis is that it cannot be stopped no matter what. The asteroid Apophis is set to be seen in the sky in 2025 with its effects and its shotgun blasting of a third of the earth. This is what they're saying. Read your Bibles. And a third of the earth and a third of the earth and a third of the earth is going to come by in 2029. So everything is about global depopulation by 2025. They must have World War III with a uh, quarter of the Earth's population killed by 2025. So they're more manageable when this asteroid comes in 2029. They need transhumanism to go out through the genetics of all the people by 2025, which is what they did the last three years. They need a consolidation of all supply chains. They need a consolidation of all manufacturing. They need a consolidation of all banking. They need a consolidation of all governments. They need a consolidation of all telecommunications. They need to consolidate it all right now because of the astral catastrophism that they all know is coming by the hand of God to judge the earth. And right now is this wholesale push, unrestrained, insatiable push for global depopulation and consolidation because they know what's coming next. And in their Nimrodian hubristic arrogance, they think they can beat it. That's where all this is going, Scott. Yeah, that's that's uh, very well put. Just the, I want, just want you to quickly answer about the normalcy bias, then I have one last bigger question for you. So the normalcy bias factor that you referenced in one of the questions earlier, I just would like you to comment on it because I, I think your take on it is fantastic. Yeah, I'll give a rough, you know, it's hard, like I don't have any notes in front of me, so sometimes it's hard to remember all the nuances of these, of these, okay. uh, even these different lexicons and stuff, but um, normalcy bias occurs when an individual is faced with a traumatic or highly emotional experience that's outside their norm. And because it's outside their norm and they do not have a paradigm for it, they actually shut down, go into like a zombified like state and they maintain their normalcy no matter what the new information is informing them of. So it's a complete denial of empirical objective reality. That's what a normalcy, but you have a bias towards maintaining your normalcy. So what you'll see is, let's say a nuclear strike hits New York, uh, Dulce in New Mexico, uh, maybe a deep water port in the Southwest, hits a couple missile silos in Montana and North Dakota and a little bit in Nebraska. And then it takes out Colorado Springs with uh, Cheyenne Mountain, some of our deep underground bases. Those are all your, those are kind of your primary targets in the United States of America. So those hit, boop, 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 boop. They hit, you know what normalcy bias does is people will sit down and turn on their TV and keep watching their Netflix series because they can't, they can't, it, like they're fracturing. It's a traumatic, they're, they're fracturing. They will go and get online and pay their insurance payment for their vehicles for the next six months. As they're watching on the news that these 15 strategic targets just got hit in the middle of the night and you didn't even know it because right. 
regardless of what Hollywood has shown you, nuclear weapons are a big deal, but they're not as big a deal as what you've seen in Hollywood. Like you wouldn't know it. You right now, Scott, if we got hit by 15 nukes on the primary targets, I wouldn't know it. You wouldn't feel a shockwave. You're not going to see anything. You're not going to hear anything. You're not going to experience it. You would have no clue that it happened. You would have no clue depending on where you're at. Only the immediate, you know, concentric circles of effect of the blast radius. Would anybody have a clue what happened? So again, that's that normalcy bias is that in light of new information through a traumatic experience, your mind literally fractures and you will not adapt. It's a lack of adaptability to new information that may be traumatic. So you maintain your normalcy no matter what. That's what's happening right now in real time. I mean, that's what's been happening in the last three years. What was the anthem of the lukewarm apostate Christianity church? Can't wait to get back to normal. Was it not, Scott? That was the language that everybody was using. We can't wait to get back to normal. Normalcy bias as they have trannies reading to their kids in public schools and at the head of the Department of Defense. And we're fighting a three front war with the world's superpowers and every single thing changed overnight. The the anthem of the apostate churches. We can't wait to get back to normal and have our trunk or treat and do our capital campaign and put a new student center in and get gaming systems so we can be relevant to the community. Insane. It's insane. That's how deep normalcy bias goes. This thing is already happening and people are maintaining their normal. Nothing you do should be normal right now, ladies and gents. Nothing you should be. Everything changed on October 7th. Everything changed. That was when Hamas invaded Israel. The 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 sands of time got flipped over. The grains of sand are now falling. And there is going to be a last grain of sand that does fall. That's uh, that, that's right on. I mean, I'm my uh, wake up since Grace's murder is trying to change the normalcy bias and just in one lane, the medical murder lane. And it is it, it seems impossible to get very I mean, the uh, to get people to even be awake to that simple thing. And, you know, you're talking about something, you know, much more far reaching. You know, my last question, Jamie, is related to you know we you mentioned about your your uh, using a fire hose and you know from <laughs> yeah from people I was a firefighter are, so <laughs> yeah <laughs> well it's fantastic it it's just how <clears throat> because of what I've been working on I'm I, I'm I'm used to that I've had to develop ways to boil down um all this stuff coming at me so what I have done is I lay out some basic truths so then I can decide where does this fit or should I just dismiss it because it's it's um, designed to steal my time. So, yeah. for example, I'll just give you a, some things that I think about when this stuff comes at me. And then I'd like you to add to that is so people can see how do you discern all of this? I'll just give you, I'll start with. So one is that by satanic minions for money and population reduction. Uh, number two, God is not done with Israel and is using Satan to facilitate his timeline. Number, number three, everything is, fits into the antichrist and false prophet systems because Genesis 3, Satan's role is his heel, which is us. So anyway, these are, so I use these type of bigger picture things to discern all the stuff coming in because it's, it's, it's just so much. So how do you do, I mean, you must do something similar. I'm just curious, uh, you know, because I have the, the you've, you've uh, been graceful enough to come on. I just wanted to get your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it is. That's why I always talk about the macro because it is, you have to have the big picture. Right. And the, the big picture is is really Genesis. I mean, and, and it's one of those things where where, you know, I, I often say, like, you can't know the fullness of the gospel. Not that you can't be saved and not that you can't be undone by the grace of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is by the completed work of Christ and Christ alone. But you can't understand the the real depths and the majesty and the beauty of what God 
is doing and has done and is going to do unless you understand Genesis. That's the macro umbrella with which you have to understand everything else from there on out is from Genesis 1-1, the world was tohu and bohu, as it says in the Hebrew, without form and void. And the Lord stood over the Leviathan, the chaos dragon. Literally in the first <laughs> chapter, first verse, he's telling you, this is what's going on. And then you don't even, it doesn't take long till you get to chat. He starts speaking reorder into the chaos, right? And then it doesn't take long where he's like, hey, the answer to your guys' rebellion is watch this. I'm going to create humanity, my image, out of the dust. And having not seen me, they'll choose to worship me. Even though you guys saw me in full and you worship me, watch this. And I'll give them grace. You get no grace. And then it goes to the tree of the garden, you know, the tree of good and evil in the garden. It's like, watch this. That's my tree. And, uh, and, and you want to usurp it and try to create your own government and lead my people astray to not submit themselves under the true and better government. And then he goes, okay, now, and now we're going to have genetic warfare. Now we're going to have seed warfare. Now we're going to have all, and it just goes on and on and on. Now there's another incursion. There was giants in the earth in those days and also thereafter, right? Now you have this genetic amalgamation perversion of the genome because it's the creator of a God. Then it goes to the land of Canaan. Then it goes, and it goes on and on and on. So I guess in answer to your question, Scott, it really is about operating out from that macro view. So let's take, for instance, uh, a micro, not diminishing this at all, Scott, not at all, but the medical malfeasance. Okay, you can't understand the medical malfeasance and the medical murder that occurs unless you understand Genesis 6 and what the Septuagint and extra biblical texts say what they were doing through medical, through the Esclupian worship, serpentine worship. Look at the medical symbol over the entirety of the face of the earth. What's the medical symbol? Serpents right. intertwining. It looks like a double helix DNA strand where the serpent is like, See, you don't, people can't understand why do they do what they do through the medical system and the pharmacia. What is pharmacia? What is the sorceries? What's this Asclepian worship? This it, It's like you can't understand it unless you have the micro. Then you go, that's why they come through that way. That's why. Oh, Christ Jesus is the healer. Christ Jesus is the comforter. Oh, they counterfeit it this way and actually leads to your destruction. It's like Jesus is the cornerstone of this. It says, uh, oh, Zerubbabel talks about in Zechariah, Zerubbabel having laid the cornerstone and the capstone. Oh, they counterfeit. They have a cornerstone on the pyramid on the back of a dollar bill, but their capstone is unfinished. See, ours is finished. Everything is an exact tip for tat. Oh, you appeared as a fiery serpent in the tree of knowledge and good and evil, but the tree wasn't burned up. I'll show up in a bush. And I'll use a lesser thing to exact my thing. You get the whole name. It says all the nations of the world lie in the evil one, but I'll take one as my own possession. Little sliver Israel, you have it all. I'll take this. Watch what I'll do. You, and it's like every single detail is this tit for tat, tit for tat, tit for tat. Every little detail of our micro, you know, detailed reality can only be understood through the greater macro of this cosmic warfare that's going on. When Jesus walked on water, it wasn't about walking on water, asserting his authority over creation itself. It was, he spoke over the way, the wind and the waves. He said, be still. He was asserting his supremacy and dominance over the rebellion. Everywhere the rebellion is depicted, the great rebellion, the original rebellion, a third of the fallen angels, is depicted as the roaring and the foaming of the waves. That's why it says in the book of Revelation, and the sea and the waves will be no more. The rebellion's done. He's asserting his victory. He was crucified on Golgotha, Calvary. Go, what's Golgotha? The place of the skull. The place of what skull? The place of the skull of Goliath, the Nephilimic freak show testifying to how deep the rebellion went, that Christ's blood poured out over Golgotha where the Nephilimic skull was on display from David, passed on through all the lineage to show the supremacy of Christ. We win, you lose. That is the macro through which everything has to be known and understood, Scott. So that's kind of the macro, I guess, 
through which I filter all this stuff. And it's like, I don't have to go, oh, transhumanism. You know, the Mormon church is the number one leading proponent of transhumanism. Bill Gates is a Mormon. All these guys are Mormons. They're all doing this stuff through Mormonism. Mormonism believes in the deification of angelic beings. They worship the fallen angels. It's free masonry repackaged. That's why they do this and that and the other thing. And their ceremonies are this and that and the other thing. They are worshiping the fallen angels. I don't have to go, that's hard to believe. Because I know the macro and I go, that's absolutely what they're doing. That's what humanity has always done. Oh, they want to alter DNA through messenger ribonucleic acid. What's the only other word for messenger in any English dis- dictionary? Angel. mRNA. Angel. Ribonucleic acid altering your proteins and your mitochondrial you know, processes of encoding and decoding and transference of information at a genetic level. It's literally... Angel rival nucleic acid is the only other way that you can interpret that. So I go, yes, I believe it. I I can receive that without going, oh, that's conspiracy. That's hyperbole. That's sensational. Why? Because I know the word. I mean, I'm not saying that with any hubris or vanity. I'm just saying because the Lord's word reveals that is what I'm saying. Like the Lord's word says that. So I go, yes. And it, and it's, you know, the wars and rumors of wars and blah, blah, blah. And how about... At the Great Reset, I don't have to debate whether or not they're doing the Great Reset. I know they're going to do the Great Reset because I know when the black horse loose is loose, he artificially creates global hyperinflation. And it will cost you a day's wages for a loaf of bread. So they can, I know that. I know I don't have to be concerned about central bank digital currencies, whether or not that's viable or not viable through blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. I don't have to wonder about that because I know unless you give allegiance to this global governance and this new religion, you will not be allowed to buy or sell anything and operate in the public economy. I know that because that's what the Bible says. Guess what they're going to roll out through central bank digital currencies? I it's not debatable to me. I don't have to wonder if there's, you know, error in this stuff or, or whatever going on. It's like, yes, they're saying it because the word already says it. So they're just, they're, they have no control of their other of own. They have no control. They are, they are, they talk, they call us useless eaters or useful idiots. They're the useful idiots. They have no clue that they're literally only ever being used to God's ends. Even all these nations converging on Israel, they're like seething, they're snarling, they're seething, right? They got like this bloodlust that's insatiable through the blood cult of Islam, right? The, the offspring of the Ishmaelites, and they think that they're winning and they're going to win. You know what it's all designed to do, Scott? I know you know. It's all designed to get Israel to look on him who they have pierced and to finally have their heart of stone replaced with the heart of flesh that acknowledges Jesus as the Christ. And finally, the two shoots of the olive tree are fully engrafted and fully secure and fully in in Christ alone. That's what God's doing. They think that they're getting one over on Israel. It's God's plan unto the repentance and the restoration of his covenanted people. He said what he was going to do. He's going to do it. They And they don't even know that. They are the useful idiots in the hand of the Lord. Boy, that's uh, it, that particular phrase is near and dear to me because Grace had Down syndrome, and so she was called a useful or a useless eater, and that is mm. you know part of um, you know the the way that our society worships money and our fiat currency. They've convinced society that because people on Medicare and Medicaid, the disabled and the elderly, account for fifty percent of the annual federal budget that those people don't deserve medical care because we've got to ration care. And you know that's the paradigm I've been living through for the last two years. Yeah. So Jamie, I'm going to do just a very short close and then I want to come back to you for the final word before we end today. Sure. Uh, so what I just to start with closing, you know, what Jamie talked to, about today is, I mean, this is intense stuff, uh, but God that we discussed today ahead of time And there has never been a more important time to reconcile with God. I believe the reason we are in this mess is because of rejection of God. And it is past due that God is is judging us. I mean, we are deserved this. 
uh, you know, as I have come to grips with how I've been indoctrinated with lies, there's only one thing that I'm certain of, and that is Jesus Christ died, was buried and rose again on the third day so that whoever believes in him will be reconciled with the Father and have eternal life. And what happens Amen. when you come to grips with that is repentance. And the it, that repentance word is also very important to me because what I see happening is that there is a movement, the anti-establishment movement is against what we just got done experiencing over the last three years. And they're really against it. They have, you know, you could call it the Patriot movement. I call it the anti-establishment movement because it's much bigger than the Patriot movement. But that movement is a diversion. And the reason it's a diversion is because they don't have the central theme of that movement as rejection of God and repentance. So that is our clue to not follow that anti-establishment movement um, because it is part of what Jesus warned us about. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And that movement is not part of, is not part of Jesus. So anyway, that's my final thoughts, Jamie. I, I appreciate you coming on more than you know, but I'd like you to have the final word, of course. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on, Scott, you know, and, and I know that the singular question that always gets elicited, you know, whenever talking about uh, these, these uh, weightier, more prescient topics is, so what do we do? That I mean that that is part that is the number one question that I get is so what do we do you know and and usually people are looking at that from a practical preparedness standpoint which is fine there's nothing wrong with that there is a there is numerous biblical precedents for practical physical tangible preparedness in the natural and it's good and you should be doing those things uh we're we're Jesus said, I told you about these things ahead of time so that you not be caught unaware. You know, we have the entire story of, of Joseph and in, in the time of plenty preparing for the time of famine that was certain to come that God forewarned. You know, we have the, the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins and on and on it goes in Proverbs, you know, and, and a wise man foresees danger coming and plans accordingly, but a fool goes on and suffers for it. But the, at the end of the day, the only thing that I know that matters and that has values is that it, it has values that you would, would repent, repent and turn back to the Lord. Repentance is the only thing that matters. Uh, we're warned of even Achan's sin and, and Joshua 7 about how God said, you cannot, you have been made liable for destruction on the field of battle until you purify your camp. He says, you cannot stand against your enemies until you appear your camp. The, the charge to every letter to every church in the book of Revelation, Revelation uh, you know, 2 and 3 is, repent and I'll restore you. Repent. And, it, and he's like, let those with ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Don't you understand? Don't you understand the sufficiency of my son? Don't you understand the sufficiency of his blood and his, and his propitiation for your sin? Don't you understand the power of the resurrection? He literally, speaking of the fallen angels again, he went to preach to the captives. People don't understand the power of the gospel. There's a reason why Christ went to the cross. It went, it didn't stop at the cross. The cross went somewhere. He went through the cross to shield, to preach to the captives, and then was so such an amazing warrior king that he asserted his supremacy over all, everything and testified to the fact that he was the first fruits by having the power to take up his own life again, to reoccupy the seat at the right hand of the Father. And it's like what, what we ought to be doing is doing business with a holy God who loves us. And he proved it. He proved it that while we were sinners and while we were dead in our trespasses, he sent his son to die for our sins. He's already proved the lengths to which he's willing to go while you were his enemy. What do you think he's willing to do if he calls you friend or son and daughter and heir and co-heir? And he puts the ring on your finger and the cloak on your back. And he says, I've, I've prepared a meal for you, son and daughter, and you are going to recline at my table and I'm going to serve you. Are you kidding me? The king of glory is going to wait on you and serve you. And he says he's going to crown you, the king, of, where all the crown, everybody wants to throw their crowns at his feet. And he goes, no, I'm going to crown you with glory, honor, and praise at my revelation. It's like, do get right with the God who loves you and bought you. 
That's what you ought to be doing. You ought to have an identity so deeply rooted in Christ Jesus that you have a, such anointed as sufficiency of the blood of Christ that you're like, bro, you ain't taking my life. He bought and paid for it. It's hidden in him. You want my life? Go ask my king. Like that's it says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony, and they did not love their lives so much as they are afraid to lose it for the sake of Jesus Christ. It's like, and it, Daniel eleven thirty two tells us that those who know their God, right smack in the middle of this hot mess, the times of Alexa, which never has been, hello, think of all the horrors of, of the history of humanity, times of Alexa, likes of which ha, never has been and never will be, be again. It says at that exact time, those who know their God, will be strong and go forth and do daring feats of valor. I'm like, sign me up, God. Like, where's the recruiter's office? <laughs> I want in on that action. I want in on it. And so when people ask, what should I do? What should I do? What should I? I'm like, do business with a holy God who loves you through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what you ought to be doing. All the other stuff, practical preparation. Sure, do what you can, but don't you dare do it out of fear. Because he hasn't given you a spirit of fear. Do not operate out of the wrong spirit. He's given you a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. That's so phreneo in the Greek. That means a mind that has been rescued, salvaged, and delivered from absurd and illogical or highly emotional thoughts. So any mind out from that isn't the mind of Christ. That's the mind of the powers of darkness. That's the mind of a reprobate world. So yes, we prepare practically and tangibly, but we prepare spiritually to grow our roots down deep to the streams of living water so that when the waves and the torrents come and when the hot winds comes, our leaves are always green and we never fail to produce fruit. That's what we need to be doing, Scott. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for thanks for coming on. If you want to hold just for a minute after Don's going to uh, uh, time us out with our, our clothes and then I'll we'll say goodbye. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. For further details, we return you now to your regularly scheduled program.